Umajanatinidandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Vilashu Bhilvamangal Kakwa was an ordinary human being, yet he developed many ecstatic symptoms in his body. What then is so astonishing about these symptoms being manifest in the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? In the ecstatic mood of conjugal love, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was on the highest platform. Therefore, all the exuberant ecstasies were naturally visible in his body. Kapod. Lila Shukhi is Bilvamangal Thakur Goswami. He was a South Indian, a Brahmana, and his former name was Shilhan Mishra. When he was a householder, he became attracted to a prostitute named Chintamani, but eventually he took her advice and became renounced. Thus he wrote a book named Shanti Shakata, and later by the mercy of Lord Krishna and the Vaishnavas, he became a great devotee. Thus he became famous as Bilva Mangala Thakur Goswami. On that elevated platform, he wrote a book named Krishna Kanamrita, which is very famous among Vaishnavas. Since he exhibited so many ecstatic symptoms, people used to call him Lila Shuk. Text 80. Purve Braja Vilashe Jaitin Abhilashe Jotneho Ashad Nahoilo Shri Radhar Bhavasha Apane Kare Hongika Shaitin Bhashtu Ashadilo during his previous pastimes in Vrindavan, Lord Krishna desired to enjoy the three different types of ecstasy. But despite great endeavor, he could not taste them. Such ecstasies are the monopoly of Srimati Radharani. Therefore, in order to taste them, Sri Krishna accepted the position of Srimati Radharani in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Apane kare ashadane shikhailo bhaktagane Prema Chintamaniya Prabhu Dhani Nahi Jane Shthana Shthan Jare Tare Koilodan Mahaprabhu Data Shiramani By personally tasting the mellows of love of Godhead, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught his direct disciples the process. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is a wealthy capitalist possessing the touchstone of love of God. Not considering whether one is a proper or improper recipient, he gives his treasure to anyone and everyone. Thus he is the most munificent. Purport, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's capital is the touchstone of love of Godhead, and consequently he is a great owner of that transcendental treasure. After making unlimited amounts of gold, the touchstone remains the same. Similarly, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, although distributing love of Godhead unlimitedly, still remained the supreme owner of this transcendental opulence. His devotees, who learned it from him, also had to distribute it munificently all over the world. This Krishna consciousness movement, following in the footsteps of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his confidential devotees, is also trying to distribute love of Godhead all over the world, through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now these are obviously uh, very confidential topics being discussed, as we see in the two verses from here. It stated, Kohiba kotha nahe, kohile keho na bhujay. This is actually not. This is actually not topics for discussion, not even to be spoken. But then, uh, even if it is spoken, no one will understand it. Nevertheless, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami has compiled these topics and. He says that those who are qualified, those who are devotees, they will relish it. And the non-devotees, they won't be able to understand it anyway. These topics, uh, the understanding of them has been much uh, misused. 
which is why Srila Prabhupada was very cautious in discussing them from the time of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Devotees in our Sampradaya have been very cautious about discussing these topics. Bhaktino Thakur stated that it's better if all the Rasa Shastras are removed from the world. He thought it was better that they not be there. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give this and Bhaktino Thakur is better they're not in the world at all because he perceived that people were so much misusing it. And there's the famous incident where Bimala Prasad, Siddhanta Saraswati, who had been trained by Bhaktivinoda of Thakur to uh, produce books using the latest technology, which is of course now all out of date, but at that time, how to operate the machine, make galley proofs, and check them and correct them and all. Bhaktivinoda Thakur taught Bimala Prasad, the operation of the printing press, because Bhaktino Taka was very much interested in producing Vaishnava literature. At that time, there was a great danger of the whole Vaishnava literature becoming completely lost. We hear that Bhaktino Thakur himself, even to find a copy of Chaitanya Bhagavata, it wasn't very easy. It took him quite some endeavor and searching even to find a copy, because a copy in those days meant a handwritten copy. So he was, Bhaktino Thakur was very eager to have all the Vaishnava literature printed and in this way preserved and disseminated. But when Siddhanta Saraswati asked Bhaktivinoda Thakur for permission to print Govinda Lilamrita or Gita Govinda I can't remember which one it was mm-hmm. Govinda Lilamrita Bhaktivinoda Thakur said yes you can but first he refused and then again when Siddhanta Saraswati asked him he said, yes you can print one copy for yourself and maybe one more someone else in future may be able to understand may be able may be qualified to understand that. Mm. So in this way, uh, Bhakti Rav Thakur, Bhakti Siddhan Sarasar Thakur, Srila Gopi Shah, Das Babaji Maharaj, and our own Srila Prabhupada, they were all very cautious in approaching these topics, in, dis- in discussing these topics. Although they did preserve them in writing, but they did publish the Chaitanya Charitamrita. First of all, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he published with his commentary, Anubhasya, then Bhakti Siddhant, sorry, Amrita Prabhaha Bhasya, then Bhakti Siddhant Sarasar Thakur gave his Anubhasya, and then Srila Prabhupada composed his purpose to Chaitanya Charitamrita. Largely, based on those two commentaries. And Srila Prabhupada added his own commentary also. So, uh, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's moment, distribution of love of Krishna up to the highest level. Most people have in this world have very little inclination toward Krishna. That's why we're in this world. Krishna Bhuli, Seji, Anadi Bahimuk, from time immemorial, having forgotten Krishna, from time immemorial we are inimical to Krishna. So uh, not many people are interested in Krishna. They might be interested in God, but not much interested in Krishna. Some God who sits on a cloud and throws down successful lottery tickets. This kind of God is wanted. But the kind of God that you have to surrender to this kind of God is surrendered to for His pleasure. Our eternal occupation is to be a slave. Jive shuru hoy krishne nitya das. Das means a servant or slave. But not many people are interested in that. 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he also took the position of a servant. And his ecstasies, as described here, they don't seem very nice. He's crying, lamenting, rubbing his face against the wall. It doesn't seem like a very relishable situation. The description, his his body in ecstasy, sometimes the uh, joints became loose and they were connected only by skin to his body and sometimes his joints and his head went inside his body. It, 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 does, it, it doesn't sound very pleasurable. But this is the, the transcendental ecstasy that Krishna himself has come to relish. And those who are very fortunate, they will be attracted to that. This is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give. He sent his devotees, in, recently he sent Srila Prabhupada, to fulfill his own prediction. Prithivite ache jatanagaradigram sabatra prachahoi ve morana. That my name, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, will be preached in every town and village of the world. So to uh, inaugurate the worldwide preaching of Krishna consciousness, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sent Srila Prabhupada. But Srila Prabhupada, he, he didn't speak very much about these internal ecstasies of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Srila Prabhupada, in preaching all over the world, he mostly spoke on basic principles, even practically prior to Shastric principles. Of course, these are mentioned in Shastra. And from my analysis is that Srila Prabhupada, the two points he stressed the most in preaching in the West uh, were that we are not the body, we are eternal spirit soul, and that, that we are controlled. Therefore, we should accept that there is a controller. And you want to, if, if you don't know who it is, ask me, I'll tell you. If you don't have a proper understanding, take God, Krishna. The Srila Prabhupada preached on these points, which of course they are mentioned in Shastra, but they are uh, deductible by logic. We can understand that we are not the body, we are eternal spirit soul. And Krishna himself in Bhagavad Gita gives examples to show us how we can understand it by our intelligence, the famous example. The body is always changing, but the person stays the same. Therefore, the person should be understood to be different from the body. Therefore, when the body goes through its final change of death, it should be understood that the person continues to exist, because the person is separate from the body. And that there is a supreme controller, that we are controlled. We don't choose to die, we don't choose to get old, we don't choose suffering, but we are forced to do so. Therefore, we should accept that we are controlled. So Srila Prabhupada, he mostly preached on these points, although his aim was to raise people to the highest level of discussing and uh, relishing, hearing the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Krishna, Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is non different from Sri Krishna. So he wanted to bring people to that level, but as a practical teacher, he didn't try to bring them to the highest level immediately. Just like devotees today are going to Gainesville to a football game, isn't it? So is anyone planning to go up to the football fans and talk to them about the internal ecstasies of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Any volunteers? That, uh, my dear sir, we'd like to tell you about someone who appeared in this world 500 years ago and rubbed his head against the wall until the blood came out and then sometimes he would uh, jump in the air and fall on the ground in ecstasy. He was pine, he was Krishna, come, uh, so Radha and Krishna combined. We can't speak these people. Even, 
we can't speak this to ordinary people. Even to people who are supposed to be advanced theologists. If we go to an interfaith conference, what will people understand of this? Srila Prabhupada, when preaching to Christians, if they were somewhat favorable, he would ask them to chant the name of Christ and to stop eating meat, or at least to stop eating cows. That was the cow's meat. So that's the level that people were on. Uh, nevertheless, as stated in this purport, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his confidential devotees are trying to distribute love of God all over the world. That is the ultimate aim. How is that possible? Through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. By this chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. The, what is impossible becomes possible. Already it was considered impossible that anyone in the Western world could take to Krishna consciousness. That they can come to the highest level is possible. Everything is possible by the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. Now, uh, among Gauriya Vaishnavas, traditionally, uh, well, after the time of Narottam Das, especially, Narottam, Srinivas, Shamananda, devotees, they were mostly concerned with their own bhajan of uh, studying such scriptures. This Chaitanya Charitamrita is well known among Gauriya Vaishnavas. Many, they know, they, of course it's very easy for Bengalis to remember these verses. So it's uh, very well known, widely recited, the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, I was once in a village in Bangladesh and uh, everyone, I was just staying in one man's house and everyone had gone, everyone in the house except me and this old man who was blind practically, they'd all gone out to some family function or something like this. So. He asked me to, he brought out an old copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita and he asked me to read it to him. And just by uh, the light of the, the uh, some oil wick light, there's no electricity. So I asked him, where shall I read? And he said, anywhere. So I just opened the book and started reading. And he started chanting along with me the verses. It seems he, he knew the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita. Like he couldn't see anymore but like that. There's so many people who, who uh, know about the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But it was mostly uh, going on in a formal way, not trying to preach widely. That after the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Bengal, you know, there was uh, Nityananda Prabhu and his followers preached. Narottam Das and his followers preached and they formed the, the, the people that came as disciples they formed what they called parivars or families and the descendants not exactly of Nityananda Prabhu uh, directly but the descendants of uh, well there was Bia Chandra and his disciples they form what is called the Nityananda Vamsha, Goswamis, who they would initiate. There was, many people came by preaching and then these supposed descendants of Nityananda Prabhu, they, they initiated and then their sons initiated, but it was already just one big family which had come from the original preaching and then their descendants and then their descendants and their descendants in this way. Uh, there, were, there were many people who uh, uh, who identified themselves as followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, followers of Nityananda Prabhu, and the gurus in family succession. They uh, 
generation after generation, they taught this uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita and they formally initiated others. But there wasn't much endeavor to preach. And in course of time, uh, many wrong ideas about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came up. So there was, there was some so-called new incarnations of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, various uh, discrepancies were introduced in the name of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu into the Sampradaya. And the preaching spirit became lost. Vaishnava became just like another caste within Bengal. That if you're born in a Vaishnava family and you're a Vaishnava. That's all. Just like someone may be they're born in a family or whatever, what, who, whichever deity that, that means maybe uh, Shiva or Durga, whichever is the family deity, then you're born in that family and you worship that deity. That's all. So if you're born in a Vaishnava family, then you're a Vaishnava. And if you're not, then you're something, you're Shakta or Shaiva or whatever. So there wasn't uh, any preaching spirit. And that was attempted to be revived by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And later by Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswar Thakur. And then all over the world by Srila Prabhupada. So these uh, traditional the who nowadays claim themselves to be Orthodox Vaishnavas, because they come in the family lines. Actually, they're mostly, there's not much going on. Most of the Goswami caste, they don't have many followers nowadays, so they have to supplement their incomes by being shopkeepers or railway employees or something like that. So you find the your guru, the, the, the family guru is a railway employee. You know very well. Chitana, <laughs> he knows all that. But, uh, in Bangladesh, then, I was told that one Gosai, the family guru, he, he'll go to, he said, I'll only come to your village if you get me some, you must promise to get me some Hilaj match, which means one, one special type of very tasty fish. Only if you arrange on that condition, he will come to the village. So, very fallen condition. So, on one hand, the spiritual practice was not very high. Some of the Goswamis, they were learned and they were themselves practicing. When I say Goswamis, I don't mean Rup Sanatana Bhattaragunath. I mean the fact the Goswami families who claim themselves to be Goswami. Some of them were learned and following, but they didn't require it of their disciples. The only requirement of their disciples was to call themselves a disciple and uh, give some dakshina. That was all. And nothing else was required. Uh, and there were some reclusive Babajis who were serious, but many of them were not serious either. And in fact, the name of Vaishnava, Boshtam, is very big. that's the uh, a Bengali Apabrams, which means uh, distortion of the world. They were considered horrible. Among respectable people, the Vaishnavas were considered horrible. And the monasteries of the Babajis, they were considered dens of, what do you call that? Vice, dens of vice, because the Babajis, they were all, Babaji men, they had some Seva Dasi, some woman who was supposed to be the, the Seva Dasi. The idea is they're just like a gopi or something like this, but the interaction of the Babajis with the Seva Dasis was uh, not proper. So in, um, this idea of cultivating the confi 
confidential understanding without attempting to fulfill the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to preach Krishna consciousness widely. And we've seen historically that it degrades. Those who simply talk of these high levels and discuss it as if it's a very easy thing to enter into, they degrade. It's not simply by discussing and imagining oneself to be at the highest level that one can actually be on that level. One has to fulfill the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. What is the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? That Rupa Goswami has revealed, we pray, Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Sthapitam Jena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Yangadati Sropadanti Kam The Vaishnavas, they pray to Rupa Goswami. The Sampradaya from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is called the Rupa Anuga Sampradaya, the followers of Rupa Goswami, not the Chaitanya Anuga Sampradaya or Gaur, Gaur Anuga Sampradaya. They're called Rupa Anuga Sampradaya because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is the inaugurator of this Gauriya Vaishnava Sampradaya. But the teachings, he he gave the responsibility for guidance and teachings to Rupa Goswami. Therefore, the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they are known as Rupa So, the Gauriya Vaishnavas, they pray to Rupa Goswami that uh, when will he bestow upon me the tip of his lotus feet? <coughs> He has established within the world Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's heart's desire. So, uh, what is that heart's desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Rupa Goswami revealed that. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, this, uh, actually I was going to speak on that verse about Anyway, um, he was always feeling in the, in the mood of Radha. He, he was always feeling separation from Krishna uh, in the mood of Radharani at Kurukshetra where she got Krishna, especially at the time of Rathiyatra, she got Krishna but she was after a long time for her a moment is like 12 years or more and after a long time she again got Krishna, but still she was dissatisfied. She wanted to bring him to Vrindavan. So that is the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu at Rathiyatra. And generally he was in the mood of Radha uh, at the time when Uddhava came to Vrindavan, in which uh, at first they thought Krishna himself has come, the gopis thought, all the residents of Vrindavan thought because Uddhava looked so much like Krishna. And Krishna sent a message through Uddhava, which just made the, the message for the gopis, which just made the gopis feel more frustrated. <clears throat> so uh, this wasn't known to most people. Only Swarup Damodar knew this. And Rupa Goswami was the other one. Swarup Damodar, he didn't tell anyone else. He, he assisted Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in relishing his ecstasy. He, Sarup Damada, he could understand what are the feelings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Sarup Damada would sing songs and verses to complement that mood. Or if the mood became too, too much of transcendental bitterness, bittersweet suffering, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood became so intense, then sometimes Sarup Damodar would sing another song to change the mood. So Sarup Damodar, he was completely in uh, like the alter ego of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sarup Goshair, what is that? Sarup Goshair Bhagana Jai Barnan Prabhur Abhishtatar Bhaka Kayamam. There is no describing the good fortune of Sarup Damada because 
his mind, body and words were fully absorbed or fully just like merged or integrated with that of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he knew this but he did not broadcast, he didn't tell anyone. It was just between him and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Rupa Goswami, he knew that also. Uh, that he, Rupa Goswami composed a verse which explained the mystery that the devotees couldn't understand that why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, while uh, in front of the Rat, in Ratha Jagannath's cart in Ratha Yatra, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was singing some Kami love song. That's what it's, it's just like you're the, the guru of the whole universe and then he starts singing some pop song or something like this. She loves you, yeah, 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 something like that. What? What is he saying that for? What is it? What's going on here? Like the devotees couldn't understand. It was just, it just sounded like some Kami love song. Just, but Rupa Goswami, he could understand the import that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is singing this, even though it's, it's just from some mundane kavya or mundane poetry. That Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has heard this and he's repeating this in the mood of uh, Radha lamenting for in separation from Krishna. So that is described in this chapter here. So in this way, Rupa Goswami, he revealed the inner ecstasy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, in this chapter, Krishna Kaviraj Goswami says that no one can understand this, but if anyone has understood it, they've, they've done so by the mercy of Rupa Goswami. So therefore, in Rupanuga Sampada, he's Rup, Rupa Goswami has given the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he's revealed the inner ecstasy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now this verse, Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam, uh, which describes the inner desire, the heart's desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that has also been, uh, what is that inner desire? That desire is expressed by Rupa Goswami, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's inner desire of, Rupa Goswami, uh, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as Radha, pining for the, for the association of Krishna. But that's explained also in another way by Vaishnava Acharyas, at least Bhakti Siddhanta or Thakur sometimes explained it like this, and certainly our own Srila Prabhupada explained it like this. That Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's heart's desire is priti vite ache jato nagaradi gram sabatra pracha hoi be moranam. That Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's name will be preached in every town and village of the world. So these are Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's desires. That desire he, he personally uh, told us. So uh, certainly Srila Prabhupada, he serve the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by serving this heart's desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that everyone have the opportunity to participate in the chanting of Hare Krishna, that everyone have the opportunity to take to Krishna consciousness. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he doesn't have to come to this material world. Srila Prabhupada doesn't have to come to this material world. But they come for the benefit of us to give us this chanting and give us the opportunity to develop Krishna consciousness by chanting the holy names of the Lord and by following all the processes of sadhana bhakti. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada, he emphasized that instead of trying to uh, imitate Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, instead of trying to uh, pole vault into Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's inner ecstasies. It's better to serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Serve his mission. Serve his desire. That anyone, even in a very neophyte stage, can serve Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission by preaching Krishna consciousness. Or even if one feels that he's not very advanced or learned to <coughs> preach. Uh, anyone can, can uh, chant in public the names of Krishna or anyone can ask others to chant the names of Krishna. 
So in this way, by chanting the holy names of Krishna, as is desired by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as is the process given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then gradually one can become qualified to, by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy, by Rupa Goswami's mercy, by the mercy of all the Acharyas and Parampara, one can become qualified to uh, understand these inner ecstasies of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When I say understand, it doesn't generally understand, we think of understanding as, a, as an intellectual process. But that understanding of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is not exactly an intellectual process. Intellectually we can discuss. This, this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's, these are his inner desires, these are his ecstasies. But understanding means uh, that one is allowed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers to begin to appreciate and uh, experience what are the uh, what is the treasure that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to give so uh, this way by preaching Krishna consciousness by endeavoring to preach Krishna consciousness by becoming a servant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in preaching the Sankirtan movement one becomes uh, empowered by him one becomes blessed by him to uh, be able to relish the uh, to the degree that we can the ecstasies of Krishna consciousness. In this verse, the first verse that we read today, Nida Shukha Marta Jan Ta Hoi Bhavodha Nila Shukha Bilbamangal Thakur He's an ordinary person, not, we should never think of a Vaishnava as an ordinary person, but in the sense that he's a jiva, we're also jiva. So he could experience these uh, ecstasies of Krishna consciousness. So, Ishvara, what is that? Ishvara Shaiki Habishma, that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was, he relished great ecstasy, he's the Supreme Lord, even a jiva can do so. So that offers hope for us also. That uh, if Bilva Manga, as an apparently ordinary person, at least constitutionally, he's a jiva, he's a, then he can experience such ecstasy. Then uh, we can do also. But we can do so not by attempting to experience ecstasy. That is the fault of the Prakrita Sahajiya Sampradaya. Their, their whole endeavor is to experience bliss instead of endeavoring to serve. Those who serve, they are blessed with bliss. Those who try simply to enjoy Krishna and try to enjoy Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then they cannot actually, uh, they, they do not get the blessing. They're not allowed into the arena of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's and Krishna's pastimes. So service is the key. Uh, that is there for all of us. That is the birthright of every of every jiva. Is the bliss of pure Krishna consciousness. But one has to become purified to experience that. Srila Prabhupada very much emphasized that we remain busy in service to Krishna uh, in this preaching mission. And in this way we will gain the blessings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so much wanted this preaching. So that by doing that, uh, one becomes purified and eligible to gain the full mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hare Krishna. Any questions, comments, or protests, please? Yes, I saw the hand of Shesh Prabhu first. Marsh, thank you for the class, the class this morning. Um, is there a relationship between the Nichananda Vamsa Goswamis and, and Gaur and the uh, 
Goswamis in Vrindavan, or are they just two separate kind of Goswamis? The Goswamis in Vrindavan, the, the traditional Goswami families, they're all Bengali families. And among themselves they speak Bengali, even though they're be, and they married Bengalis, even though they're generations in, uh, many generations in Vrindavan. So, uh, no, they're not Nityananda Vamsa, they all come, just like in Radhara Mangara, they're, they're from, uh, they're in the line of Gopal. Actually, Radhara Mangara, they're from North India, that's the exception among the six Goswamis, because Gopal Bhatta preached on the north side, so they're Hindi speaking. They also speak Bengali. So, relation, yeah, in as much as they're all in the Gorya Sampradaya, but, in, Nityananda, in Bengal there's Nityananda Vangsha, Narottam Pariva, Gadatha Pariva, Advaita Vangsha, like this. Uh, well, we were saying Nityananda Vangsha means the Goswamis. And then those who are disciples, they're called the Pariva. So, yeah, well, they're different. Different Vangshas. Different dynasties. I, I don't, there's no... In the uh, in the uh, major temples of Vrindavan, they're not Nityananda Vamsha. Nityananda Vamsha are all based in Bengal, sir. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Maharaj. <coughs> um, I had a thought on the, the topic of... Uh, Approaching Krishna or, or, or a, uh, <clears throat> looking for happiness by approaching Krishna for happiness. And that stage of serving Krishna without any expectation of happiness mm. seems to be a very, very advanced stage. Very advanced stage, yeah. So, in our stage, you say that don't approach Krishna for your happiness, but just serve. Mm. Um, just a little question that, <clears throat> that we are it's, it's like approaching a, Krishna. It's like a conundrum, isn't it? Or, yeah. like, why do we at all approach Krishna? Why do we do anything? Because we, the jiva is by nature ananda mm. So whatever we do, we do for happiness. But on the other hand, if we try to directly become happy, that works against the principle of actually being happy, which is to be fully surrendered to Krishna. That's the... You want me to address this dilemma? Yeah, Bhakti Nino Thakur says, he described the jiva like this, he said, the jivas are infinitesimal in size, innumerable in number, and are <coughs> incredibly independent like Krishna. And their urgent need is... To not independent like Krishna, not to the same not, extent. Not, as independent, of course. Oh, but they have as independence. Yeah. Krishna has also the stopping of independence. Yeah. But that spiritual bliss is their urgent need. He yeah. actually uses those words. Urgent need. So, <clears throat> and it is. Always. <clears throat> as we wake up every day, there is an urgent need to experience happiness. <laughs> <laughs> and so... <clears throat> so therefore we that's why we come to Mangalati. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> That's, yes, that's a good start. <laughs> but uh, that, therefore we, we have adopted this chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra yeah. to, to supply that. Uh, okay, alright. Um, that's true. But at the same time, it's still the principle mm -hmm. is that our happiness is only in Krishna's happiness, in trying to... Uh, trying to supply Krishna's happiness. That's the only way the jiva can actually be happy. So we find in Vedic culture, not only among Vaishnavas, but in all schools, even uh, um, the, the principle of service to guru is one of selfless service. It's understood that by becoming selfless, that our own self-interest will be served. And we find that in... In all schools, Mayavadi or Shaiva or whatever, the whole principle of dharma is to teach us to act, even if we're not aware that the, that the ultimate dharma is to fully surrender to Krishna. So dharma is based on the principle of understanding. It's true that the jiva is looking for happiness, but at the same time, 
it's the constitutional position of the jiva not to be the enjoyer and to understand that we are infinitesimal and that the universe, surprise, surprise, doesn't, doesn't rotate around us and that it's our duty to serve the greater whole, even if that greater whole isn't understood as Krishna. That's the principle of dharma. So, yeah, that's inculcated in all Vedic schools. Uh, in the in the lower stage, the karma mimamsa, the idea is that, well, you serve others and you'll get rewarded yourself by dancing in heaven with the apsaras and all that kind of thing. Uh, and then in the stage of jnana, one thinks that, well, actually this world is not so enjoyable after all. But uh, by becoming self-realized, then I'll get released from it. And in Vaishnavism, the idea is that we'll serve the Lord for His pleasure, and then we get mukti. This is what the Vaishnava, Ramanuja, and Madhva, it's it. you get mukti, which means to go to Vaikuntra and serve the Lord there. But the highest understanding is that of becoming completely selfless, and actually a devotee experiences that. I think we, we can all say that the greatest happiness we've had in Krishna consciousness is when we've taken the most difficulty, isn't it? If we're looking for a comfortable life, comfort and bhakti don't go together. In Hindi, we can say, Aram haram hi. Aram, which means comfort, is haram. How do you say haram? Something horrible. Not much. So it's comfort works against bhakti. Better to be uncomfortable. Yeah, anything else? <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, with regard to the point that you finished up with, that we should stay busy in Krishna consciousness, and how that kind of ties into the business of that. To say, I was thinking of the different mm-hmm. symptoms of bhava that Chula Prabhupada discussed. Mm-hmm. There was one that he consistently mentioned, uh, of the Kalat, mm-hmm. uh, that completely averse to wasting any time. Oh, we're not wasting time. We're over time, but we're not wasting time. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Did, did Yananda, was he married or did he have a family or was he from a church? You know that? In one, no, because in one letter, when Prabhupada was going to be taking, proud to take a, a temple that was in North, North of Catholic, and they said no because we are descendants of Yananda. And it wasn't run very well, so he wrote to the governor and his brothers that, uh, what is there, a lack of. Uh, Presented to his Yanama. And then he brought up the other Goswami they use it as their that's their name, their family name, not that they're qualified. But then Prabhupada said, Nityananda was a So how did it go? Well Nityananda Shakti is Janava Devi and uh, and uh, Janava and the other wife was Vasudha. And then Biachandra was the son of Vasudha, no? And, and she was raised by, he was raised by um, Janava Mata. But then uh, he was a Brahmachari, Biachandra. Yeah, so there was the, the, the Vangsha, the, the Vangsha is the, the, the disciples of Biachandra, they started the Nityananda Vangsha. And they wrote books like, uh, what is that? Nityanamsha Vangsha Charit or something like this. And this, uh, I can't remember just now. And Nityananda Charit Amrita, which is popular in Iskon these days. <laughs> so, well, most of it's from the, nit- the so called Nityananda Charit Amrita is. It mostly consists of Nityananda's pastimes from Chaitanya Bhagavan. But there are three extra chapters. And there's no record in the old literature of Vrindavan Das writing any book called Nityananda Charitamrita. So it's widely suspected to have been a Nityananda Vamsha production to 
like the Advaita Prakash also, which is another bogus books widely circulated in this school. But we don't care about all these things, whether it's bona fide or not. It's just nectar, that's all. It's called Prakita Sahajya Bhav. If it feels good, it must be good. Never mind what our acharyas say. 